Hi, I'm Catherine Benfanti. I'm the author of Scattered, a time travel science fiction novel, and I'm going to be reading chapter three today. Chapters one and two are down below, along with the back cover blurb of Scattered. I hope you had a chance to listen to those first two chapters and you enjoyed them. This chapter, unlike the first two, which were uh, from the perspective of Ellie Rutherford, these are from William Hertz, or Will Hertz, as his nickname is, and I had a lot of fun uh, writing these. <clears throat> I'm going to do my best to read them uh, with a male voice and also uh, with his friend Alain's uh, Quebecois um, accent. I'm going to channel my four years in Montreal <laughs> and do the best I can. Uh, I appreciate a little grace uh, as, I, as I try. Um, anyways, enjoy the chapter. And uh, if you haven't yet, subscribe to my channel if you're interested. And you'll see some new videos pop up in your no notifications. Thanks. So without further ado, let's read chapter three. Friday, August 25th, 2006. Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Will Hertz. It's incredibly noisy outside, and I silently will them to shut up. I understand they're trying to have fun. Hey, I was a freshman once too. Pardon me, I was a U0 once. It's hard to get used to the Canadian lingo, even after five years. But do they have to yell and sing quite so loud? I honestly don't remember orientation being that rowdy out in the McGill Green. Unless I was a tad more intoxicated during that initiating pub crawl than I realized. Alain, my friend and fellow graduate student here in our shared office, enters and answers my thoughts. Nope, we were definitely not that loud and obnoxious, sober or drunk. I would have rather id somewhere on campus and do whatever it is they're doing. Is that singing? We're wearing bright orange hard hats? Actually, we did the same damn thing they're doing, sadly. Same nerdy drinking song, in fact, I remind him. But maybe we did it with a bit more self-respect, huh? Or a bit less beer, more likely. Or at least until later in the night, eh, Will? I groan as my friend and dependable, brilliant lab partner recalls my first alcoholic experience. It didn't go as smoothly as I had hoped for me or the front stoop of our dorm building. It's as to be expected in a province where the legal drinking age is 18, in retrospect. Thankfully, Alain was one of the few to see me in my less than spectacular moments and has been good enough to keep that quiet, even after this long. That's one of his character traits I value, knowing when to keep his mouth shut. Hard to believe I was that inept five years ago. He shrugs. Eh, you grew out of it. Now look at us, working away at the daily grind like old men. The semester hasn't even started yet, and we're sweating in this oven of an office, if you call this old room an office. Getting as much research done before Monday, when we'll have classes and homework and teaching assistant duties piled on top of this. Merde. Hey, what part of this life isn't awesome? Dream research on a cool project in the best city, working under really smart physicists? I remind him. Heck. I have to pinch myself still, and I'm halfway through our two-year-long project for our master's physics research. In addition to the research work this semester, I'll be a teaching assistant, TA, for a class taught by each of the professors who had the research. Topics in classical mechanics class for Dr. Anna Davidson, and introduction to quantum physics for Dr. Kevin Nagar. The heat and long hours make up for getting to work under Kevin and Anna. Alain groans, splain backwards in his desk chair dramatically. Uh, don't mention her name. I can't. Shake my head slowly. Still? She's... I can't. All I see is her. In your dreams? I ask. Try not to grin. You have no idea, Mech. Have you tried therapy? Hypnosis? Drugs? I suggest. Working really hard now to keep a straight face. Or dating someone your own age to distract yourself? He closes his eyes and moans slowly. Why does she have to be the way she is? Why so tempting? Hard not to grin right now, but I managed to hold back a laugh. She's so perfect and awesome on those dresses. It's hot. I'm sorry, it's hot or she's hot. Oh, shut up, Will. Alain sighs and rubs his temples. Oh, this is terrible. Why does she have to be our advisor? You mean, why does she have to be the best looking female on campus? I say quietly. Yes. Honestly, why can't she be a fat, frumpy old dog that makes me want to toss my dinner every time I see her? At least I wouldn't act brainless in front of her. Agreed. Takes you ten minutes to refocus after every time she talks to you. You're killing her productivity, man. He knows I'm pulling his leg as I cross my ankles atop my desk and lean back in my chair. 
How do you do it? You're like Teflon to her je ne sais quoi. I shrug, staring at her office door ajar. After a few seconds reverie, I shake my head of her image. I'm not blind, you know, but she's our advisor. Off limits, man. And she's kind of the same age, age as my mom, so... He half laughs, half sighs. That doesn't help me. I can't stop. No other girl I meet compares. It's torture. You have no idea. His head is buried in his hands now. It goes on for a few minute longer, bemoaning his torment. Hello, gentlemen, says a woman who suddenly fills the doorway while knocking. Ella, what poor girl are you crying over? And his pixie grin exposes two rows of blindingly pearlescent teeth. A petite woman with the face and body of someone you'd expect to see on a dance stage, Dr. Anna Davidson's looks belie her demeanor. Anna, as she prefers to be simply called, is a demanding professor and researcher who you try always to impress and never to disappoint lest it release her ferocious criticisms. But her brilliance and track record, record let her get away with it. I've been working under her supervision, besides the modern physics and relativity class of hers I took third year, for over a year, and I learned quickly to put my best foot forward under her watch. Maybe that's why you'll only see her in a professional light. And I, on the other hand, his eyes have peeked above his hands, still covering his reddening face, frozen in shock. I know exactly what's running through his brain. How much did she hear? I too froze momentarily until Anna's gaze turns to me. That bad, huh? She says. Her eyes shift from her, my eyes shift from her to him, unable to suppress a grin this time. Alan's eyes could not be wider, now in fear of what I'll say. He uh, seems to find himself enamored by a particular bartender, I say smoothly. I never rat on a friend, but sometimes it sure is fun to tease Alain. Anna throws her head back, laughing, and doesn't see Alain's shoulders relax. I was going to suggest you boys cut out early. It is summertime, officially. Go enjoy some sunshine, like those noisy freshmen outside. Or a pub? I check my watch. 3.47 p.m. It isn't happy hour yet, but that usually doesn't deter froshies. Sounds like they've already been, she mutters. Alain, whose color is still somewhat pinker than normal in the cheeks, laughs nervously. Maybe you ought to be careful what you find in the pubs, though, she says with a wink to us both. Going to the pubs already, are we? A male voice, Dr. Nagar, or Kevin, as he told us to call him once we became his graduate researchers, comes from behind the hall. A moment later, a head sparsely populated with hair pokes into the door frame a foot above Anna's. Well, I look sideways at Alain, but he's trying so hard not to ogle Anna that he hasn't yet processed what she said. No way I can get his attention now. Kevin turns to me, wearing his typical serious professor face. Will. That strength, cal strength calculation we were discussing yesterday on the titanium parts of the optics train assembly? I'm going to need that today, actually. Where are you on it? Well, I flip to a page of my notebook, Anna cuts in. Kevin, I was about to head out, and I suggested these boys do the same. Last day of summer, you know. Is it? Kevin's brow furrows as he checks his watch, a stainless steel exposed gear affair. Anna shakes her head at him in amazement, an amused smile spreading on her face. Well, I'm about to go in any case. I promised my husband I would take him somewhere nice tonight for his birthday. Have a good time, I say. I don't look over at Alain, although I can guess his reaction. Yes, I like to take time out to go on a nice date every once in a while. You boys should try the same thing sometime. All three of you, she suggests. Patting Kevin's shoulder on her way out, she adds, Don't keep them too late, eh? He sends a pleasantry her way as I exchange a hopeful look with Alain. I know we'd both like to start a weekend soon, but I'm already resigning myself to finish whatever Kevin needs. I lean over a shared work, our shared wooden work table, scarred with decades of scratches and gouges, scanning the pages of my notebook for the scrawled sketches and formula he referred to yesterday. Freed by the spell Anna always puts over him, Alain speaks first. So, are we all heading out soon? Sure, boys, but give me that value first, Will. I need to send it off today to the team in Arizona. Kevin says. Wait, wasn't this vacation week for the guys in Arizona? Are they even in today? Alan interjects before I can answer Kevin. Kevin shakes his head. No, they're out until Monday, earliest. So why? Alan trails off. Kevin looks puzzlingly at us both, not understanding. Ever the dedicated, single-minded physicist. Luckily for him, I don't mind getting work finished and out of the way. I'll get it to you before we leave, Professor, I say glancing at Alain to shut him up. Kevin gives us his trademark thumbs up and 
Thanks, boys, before heading out. As soon as he's well down the hall, I burst out laughing. After a minute, so does Anna. I fall to chien, he swears at me. I thought you were going to spill the beans to her. God, I looked like such an idiot. Davanac. Spare him an answer. At least it could have been worse, and it provided pretty fair humor on this sweaty, still afternoon. Granted, we tend to have a pretty good time, along with our other friends who share our office and lab space, no matter if we're hard at work or ribbing each other. True, it sucks the main lab I'm working out of at the moment is in the ancient McDonald Engineering Building, rather than the sleeker, newer Wong Physics Building. Heck, even Rutherford Physics has better facilities than here, and they have AC. Unfortunately, I chose to start my master's research the same month the powers that be decided it was the perfect time to begin renovations in the Wong Building. As a result, lab real estate was at a prime, so whoever could be pushed into McDonald was. I'm one of the lucky five physicists crammed into an office room on the ground floor. I'm thankful to be working with my close friends, though I feel isolated from the rest of the physics students. I think the department justified sending me to work in the engineering labs because of my double major in mechanical engineering and physics. I know my way around them, and I'm friendly with all the professors. And since Alain transferred from mechanical engineering to physics at the beginning of his second year, he isn't a complete stranger around here either. Despite our cultural and language differences, we bonded due to our status as outsiders, and also because physicists have been accused of being a different human species. Alain's pure French-Canadian. But if it wasn't for his thick colloquial accent, I'd have sworn he walked straight out of the bohemian streets of New York City's East Village, an insanely intelligent avant-garde nerd, replete with tattoos and old sandals worn three seasons out of four. I'm the straight-laced, four-eyed conservative type, pure rural American, and my bad French, still, after five years here, reflects that. Thankfully, Alain brings life to any party and any class we're in together, and I'm his voice of reason and savior when he wants to do something stupid. I can investigate the rickety fire escape of our freshman dorm after four hours of Molson's and cheap whiskey. Knowing he'd snap out of it in a few, I leave him to stew about his own failure to act professionally and reread my notebook page's strength calculations, half finished. Like him, I'd like to get out of our stifling office and at least pretend I have something more interesting to do until Monday morning. Nah, we'll face it, the most interesting thing in your life is your work, and at least that comes with good friends. Still, though, Sometimes the weekends are long and lonely lately, don't deny it. Monday can't come fast enough. That's the end of chapter three. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed chapters one and two as well. And if you're interested in reading more of Scattered, I've got links below to my website where you can learn more about it, uh, see some uh, uh, media articles about it. And then there's also a link below to my Amazon page where you can read readers reviews of Scattered, see how they liked it. And I hope you do too. It's a fun book. Thanks for listening. See you next time.